Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome the 2009 Saul Kinney Lecture on Peace and Justice, Dr. Isaldine Abu Alish. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a moment that I feel so moved and thrilled. And would love to tell my daughters that their lives will make a difference in a human life. And that's what do we need to look forward. Can we prevent any more tragedies? Can we change course to be creative and save lives and not to have any more tragedies in this world? For me, as a Palestinian who was born, raised, and still living in the Jabalia refugee camp, the 16th of January, even number 16, it's printed in my mind. But I fully believe that this was for good. It wasn't for bad. 16th of August 2008, I went, I was in travel just to find the place where can I take my family with me and to select between Belgium, Kenya, or Uganda. But life we can't plan and we can't achieve what do we want. 16th of August, quarter to five, 2008, I lost my wife. It's not an easy moment to have 80 children, but 16th of January, quarter to five, I lost my three precious daughters, niece, and my daughter and niece were severely wounded. I think from the first moment, I realized it was for good. Maybe for the short term, and for the short term run, to lose my wife, 16th of September, it was painful. But I think God the plan that this order to lose my wife 16th of September, I think it was for her that she will never cope to see her daughters killed in front of her eyes. So this was the first message that what is happening in our life what is from God is for good, but what is bad is man and human made. And it can be prevented. From the first moment, as a believer with deep faith, The first message of passion and support and to start behave as a physician who thinks of saving lives. As a physician, I don't deal with dead patients. I deal with living patients to save their lives. Thanks God and as 
I believe got the plans and gives the strength to face the tragedies. And I fully believe that this tragedy was for good from the first moment. Because as you know, this craziness in December and January between Palestinians and Israelis was a secret. And the prejudice practiced against the Gazan civilians that no one knows about it. It was a secret. And this secret must be disclosed. And must, someone must carry the responsibility of that. We were planning, me and my daughters, where to go. As I have two offers, one to be at the University of Haifa or to go to the University of Toronto. One of my daughters who were killed, she said, I want to fly. It was a plan to be at 4.30, to be interviewed live by the Israeli TV through the cell phone about issues related to women's health. But in a sudden, someone in this world does not want the voice of bees to be loud, the voice of wisdom. But I think he made a big mistake. The voice of wisdom came louder and stronger. Immediately, I called my friend who were waiting there in the studio. And I think it was planned by God. This secret must be disclosed to show the prejudice and the craziness and the size of suffering the Gazans were exposed to. While I am screaming and crying and looking at my son, Muhammad, who is 13 years old. I didn't think of the killed. I started to think of my daughter Shada, Gaida, my niece, my brother, and my children. And to think of Muhammad, what is he going to do? How can he run his life after he lost his sister, Bisan, who was his mother, his sister, his friend, everything in his life. Bisan, who was the soldier for peace that I sent to New Mexico in Santa Fe to be the first Palestinian girl in the Creativity for Peace camp. There she discovered the other side, the Israeli side, and that they are similar, and that's what she said. Muhammad, look at me. He looked at me and asked me, why are you crying, why are you crying and screaming? You must be happy. Happy of what? You must be happy, my sisters are with their mom. Their mom asked for them, and they are happy there. I said, I don't need to worry about my son. If this 13 years old showing me the passion, and how can I look forward? So I have to look forward. When I saw them, that I don't want anyone in the world to witness what I have seen. Those beautiful girls became bars. Their brains spread over the ceiling, drowning in a pool of blood. Their heads were decapitated for nothing they did. 
just full of dreams, of hopes, of education, of life and passion to others. But as you know, we are all human, and we all make mistakes. And the past can't return. I fully believe that what I have lost, what was taken from me, will never come back. I realize that from the first moment. I need to go forward and be motivated by the spirit of those I lost and to do them justice that you mentioned. That justice is one of the main needs of a humankind. And that what are we looking for? But for justice to achieve, it needs actions. And it's a matter of action. I lost the three precious daughters, but I am blessed with five other children and the future. I believe life like riding a bicycle. To keep balanced, we must keep moving. And I assure you, and want to from every one of you, if he faced any challenge, not the tragedy, he has to keep moving. And I assure you, I will keep moving forward, more determined and more strength. And then, after that, what comes the choice? The crossroads, the path of light or the path of darkness? I choose the first. This path, the path of light, in the long run, is most efficient and right choice than to live with hatred or to be consumed with revenge with all the medical consequences that no one knows them better than mine. Depression, heart diseases, hypertension, and I have to look forward and to be healthy to face any other challenges that I am going to face in the future. I fully believe that the hit which doesn't kill you will strengthen you more than before. And we must use our minds. Darkness and hatred will never be driven out by darkness or hatred. To drive up darkness, we need light. To drive up hatred, we need love. And where is love? Lying. The causes of hatred, we must search in it inside each of us. Not to go outside. It's inside our hearts. I don't think any one of us want to be full of toxins. Hatred is a toxin. It's noxious and destructive. And we must be purified of that. And to be purified of that, we must start to find the causes behind that, which is inside our hearts. As a believer, God will never change what is between people and in people themselves unless they change what is in their hearts and their souls. So we must start the change, and the change is starting inside each of us. We are facing, as a human being, challenges, and it's the role of leaders. Leaders can't be leaders if they are not challenging and risk takers. Today the world 
is in need more than any time ago for leaders who have the moral courage to act positively and make a positive difference in human life. We must not give up, but be determined and work hard. We need to discover the humanness inside each of us and adopt it as our pathway. We have to defend loudly the humanity that we all belong to. And in this way, we defend ourselves. We must go up, not to go down. In that way, we, can, we become closer and the humanity brings all of us together. When a Canadian defends someone in this world, he is defending himself. He is not defending someone else. He is defending a humanity that he shares with others. Can we speak with a human voice? Can we discover the humanness inside of each of us? And that's what do we need. Our children, they discovered it before us. And they practice it. Can we follow our children in that? And it comes now to action. It's good that we are meeting and willingness to do something and to talk. Willingness, talking, and meeting is good, but it is not enough. We must act. Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends, of our human being that we share. Then, when we speak about forgiveness, forgiveness depends on truth. And it's important to be honest with each other. It's a window of opportunity to be open and honest with each other. From the first moment of the tragedy, I know who shelled the house. For three weeks, I used to be informal correspondent to the Israeli radio and TV. And my message was one message that this war, this craziness, succeeded in one thing, to strengthen animosity, bloodshed, hatred, and to widen the gap between Palestinians and Israelis. And I was thinking always, how can we as healthcare professionals, psychiatrists, sociologists, psychologists, to rehabilitate the destruction induced by this craziness? But what happened? We must have the courage to admit our responsibilities about our actions and to be open. The scenarios started. The first scenario that there were snipers at the roof of my house. If they saw the snipers, why they didn't shell them? Why they didn't kill them? But I think there were snipers. My daughters were the most expert snipers to achieve their goals and to be successful that all of them never succeeded less than 97%. The teachers were fighting to get them in their classes. And any story, it has one scenario. And it's important for us to use our minds. We don't want to take anything from anyone else for granted. We must think of that. We must use our minds. We don't want to be underestimated by others. The second day, there were militants inside the apartment. And the scenarios, we were creative 
in having more and more scenarios. And the last scenario that they took shrapnels from my knees wounds. And they examined it and it was found to be from Kassam rockets. I think nothing killing and nothing painful than stabbing a dead person. It's immoral, unethical to stab someone who is killed. Why is this happening in this world? But what I can say to you, you must be confident in your cause, not to give up. It took one month, and after one month, the truth came up. The IDF announced its responsibility about chilling the house. And I think it was a window of opportunity to speak about honesty and the truth, and we must be open with each other. And we must start from there. Forgiveness will help you move forward, away from the pain of the past, and to be focused on the future with all, its, with all of its brightness. Indeed, forgiveness opens the door to a future that will not repeat the old tragedies. We speak about forgiveness and peace. What is peace? I don't think peace is a word or the right word that we use. Because we overuse this word and we don't know the meaning of that word. Peace is not a destination that we want to reach there. I fully believe that peace is a journey and we must equip ourselves with engines, with equipments for this journey so that this journey can be comfortable and pleasant. Forgiveness as health, as a friendship, as business, as many concepts of our life can be engines in our peace journey. So what do we need to equip and to help our people be equipped with these engines to have a pleasant and a comfortable peace journey? As a physician, still there is hope. As a physician, I will never lose hope as long as the patient is still alive though in a critical situation. For us as Palestinians and Israelis, our situation is critical. But we must not lose hope. Seeing you here gathering gives me the hope that we have to continue our sincere efforts. But we need to change course and be creative in our treatment. Concerning forgiveness, two weeks ago, I was in Prague giving a talk in Forum 2000. As you know, Ehud Barak, he was the Minister of Defense during the war and the craziness between Palestinians and Israelis. My daughter, niece, and the brother were treated in the hospital where I used to work in Tel Aviv. He used to come to visit the injured Israeli soldiers, but no Israeli official expressed his sorrow about that. But the passion and the support that I got from colleagues, friends, and people that I don't know was more than enough. I know politicians, what's their role? In that meeting in Prague, he was supposed to come to give a talk. The Egyptian ambassador asked me, are you willing to attend his talk? 
I started to think. Then I said, I have to be there. I said the first line. Because who he knows who is Zeldin. While he is speaking, he saw me. And he started to wave by his hand. After he finished his talk and he left. After he walked for about 20 minutes, he remembered Zeldin is there. And he came back. And that's what I told you. Remember, Ehud, when did we meet last time? This meeting was supposed to be in Tel Aviv. But never mind, it's not late. We must look forward. Ten months, it is not late. And that's what do we need. We need to communicate. We need to speak with each other. Once we communicate, we build the trust which is broken. If I wasn't there, nothing will happen in the right direction. So we must face each other and express our pains and be honest with each other. So what do we need? We need to understand and respect each other and that the dignity of all is equal. And what do we need? To live in collaboration and partnership and sharing, if not in peace. We need to smash and destroy the mental and physical barriers within each of us and between us. With open minds, eyes, and big hearts, we can create and have a bright future for all. And that's what do we need. And when I come to love, which is important, our hearts are not there just to bump the blood. It's there to have other functions. And we must use our hearts. And that's the poem which was written by an Israeli woman who was the mother for my daughters. And she is the facilitator for a Creativity for Peace camp where love resides in memory of Bisan. Bisan is my eldest daughter who was supposed to get her BA last June. I long to touch you, Bisan, one more time, to hug you, to tell you how sorry I am that your mom died. But now you too are gone. Your smiling face, your gentle way, your softness, your non-judgmental words, your pain for your people, your way of life, your dreams, aspiration, and your hope for peace. Just days before the war, I spoke with your dad. He gave me your phone number. It's still in my car. Every day, I glance at the number, seeing your name. Be sad. I wish I had spoken with you more, but I didn't have the guts. I spoke with you three days before you died. I told you, that I am praying for your safety. My prayers were not heard through the shilling, the bombing, the kassams, the smoke. I feel I have been betrayed by God, by my country, by the cruelty of humanity, by the warmongers, by those who think violence in the solution. And with all of this, I have been given a gift to have spent six weeks with Shada and Izzeldin. I heard no words of revenge, no hatred. I heard no anger. I heard the deep belief that peace is possible, even with this enormous loss. I have been strengthened from their strength. I am more determined from their determination. 
I am more at peace from their peacefulness. Peace and forgive me for not being able to save you from my own people. Forgive me for giving you hope that peace is possible. And then taking that dream from you. You will always be my symbol of hope, peace, and mostly gentleness. Your dad shared a dream with me days after you died. He came into a room full of men, and there you were. Sitting among us them, he asked you, Why are you sitting here, Bisan? You know, it's not acceptable in our society. You answered. All is fine now, Dad. I am happy and well. I can be here now among the men where I am needed. May no other woman need to die in order to be able to influence the men as you have been be san may we women be heard and heeded and may the men in this world get the chance to know from deep within their hearts that this is where the answer lies in their hearts where love resides what do we need to live here to discover our humanness and to open our hearts, minds, and eyes, and to have open arms to each other. This will give us the hope and the bright future for a human being in this world, which is full of pain and suffering. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.